शांति मोस्ट ऑफ द फेसेस आई सी आर फेमिलियर फेसेस मे बी सम आर फर्स्ट टाइम एज this time the older ones are specially invited baba says old is gold hmm? why is old gold because gold old is gold because it can mold real gold can mold it is very soft so those who are old in gyan they have crossed many hurdles they have accepted all the challenges and have come out victorious therefore they are worth gold and sometimes baba says even higher than gold worth diamonds so all of us are baba's diamond children even if this consciousness is there we can be so intoxicated the subject i have been given to speak on today is key ingredients to self respect baba comes and uplifts his children elevates them gives them so much self respect or teaches them how to be in self respect we notice in the world all around that people will go to any extent to get respect to be respected but will also go to any extent to disgrace someone to finish the respect of someone but what has baba told us the easy way to get respect is simple which is the easiest way to get respect don't ask for respect don't demand for respect but just give respect and you will receive respect actually all these values they come back to us only when we give but then as we do not expect any respect we have to keep on giving but how will we be able to give respect to others only when we have self respect unless i have self respect i will not be able to give respect to anyone and because i will not be able to give respect i will not get respect and the result will be i will always be thirsty of it so baba says don't expect anything from anyone it is all there within you just as we talk about the values of the soul you cannot receive peace from outside peace is within you 
you cannot receive love from outside. Love is within you because you are an embodiment of peace. You are an embodiment of love. Just become aware of it. It's all there within you, but in a latent form, in a dormant form, it is sleeping. Or we say, in other words, there's a sleeping giant within you. A giant is a giant, but if he is a sleeping giant, however big he may be, it's of no use. His largeness is not a big thing, is not great at all, because he's sleeping. And if someone is awake, then even if he is timid, maybe soft, maybe delicate, but very much awake, it knows how to protect itself. But that sleeping giant is unable to protect itself, however big it may be, because he's sleeping. When one is sleeping, he is totally in unaware, totally ignorant. So till we came to Baba, we were like the sleeping giants, we can say. There is also the story of the sleeping, uh, the Cinderella, is it? The story of... No, C Cinderella was, was she are sleeping or the prince was sleeping? The prince was sleeping <laughs> and the Cinderella went and kissed him and he realized. That's what they say, no? I think that's the story. Pardon? Oh, sleeping beauty, yes. So we are all the sleeping beauties, yes, aren't we? Should we say like that? And we have to be awakened. So Baba comes to awaken us. The story is ours. And right from the beginning, I should say, till today, till the last Murli we have heard, even today, Baba talks about self-respect. So what are the ingredients? Self-respect doesn't come just like that. Just as you cook a dish, you need some ingredients. What are you going to put in it? How will, what will be the outcome, the result? And there you have a dish in front of you. So what are the ingredients of, uh, for getting this beautiful dish of self-respect? It is there very much in us, but from Copper Age, because of body consciousness, because of self-forgetfulness, because of forgetting the Father, because of forgetting our home, our elevated stage, our status of Golden Age, forgetting all the different achievements we got from the Father at this time in, at Sangam Yuga, we lost all our self-respect. That is why you will notice Bhakti cult started because self-respect finished. You'll notice in all the different religions, there is hardly anything to mention about self-respect. Usually they will say, we are all sinners, we are sinners. It's such a strong feeling in the people that we are sinners. And the result is, even when God comes to elevate His children, we are unable to go beyond that feeling that we are sinners. Yes, 
we had committed so many sinful actions for the past 63 births. And Baba says that the alloy was mixed in the gold. But that alloy is not gold. Gold is always separate from the alloy. The alloy mixes in the gold, no doubt, but it can come out. And how can the alloy come out of the gold when that alloyed gold is melted? The melting point of gold is very high. All the other metals which are mixed with gold have a lower melting point. So they melt away, they melt away, they melt away. And ultimately gold is left in its purest form. So Baba says that you are pure gold children. Or sometimes Baba compares us to, the, to a diamond. You know a diamond when it is in the mines, it is covered from all sides by so many other metals, other minerals, other things. And therefore there, there is no shine visible. A layman may not even be able to realize or understand that, there's a, that this is a diamond in it. But then goldsmith or a, a diamond, uh, you know, smith, he knows and is able to remove the other things which have covered the diamond and ultimately he gets a diamond. I've seen, I once went to a jeweler and he showed me, he, he, gave, he showed me a, a raw piece of uh, that some, uh, you know, diamond and he said this is a diamond I said this is a diamond like this he said no we it, there is a diamond in it but it needs to be prepared yet we have a lot to do till uh, we, until we are able to really reach the diamond and even if the diamond is may is, is brought out after removing all the other things which are encircling the diamond uh, different facets have to be prepared, you know. They cut the diamond. And the different facets are prepared of the diamond and that leads to the shine in the diamond. It's not an easy thing to prepare a diamond. So Baba also says, you are the real diamonds, the real gold. But you are hidden. And Baba awakens you. Baba re-enkindles re the light in you. And how do we do it? First of all, there has to be an awareness. That is the first ingredient. The awareness has to come from inside. That is why we very often say that whatever comes from outside and goes in, that is just information. I get so much information, I hear so many things, I look at so many things, and uh, I'm reading so many things. So this is all information, all information. But that which comes out from within, that is the real knowledge. That is the real wisdom. So first it is the form of information. Then it come, becomes knowledge and then it becomes wisdom. That wisdom is there in me, in me, but it needs to be awakened. And how is it awakened? Of course, first through the information. And that's why the very first question, who am I? Who am I? Who are you? It comes in the form of an information. You are a soul. 
But then that's not enough. Which type of soul are you? Then more information about the soul. Peaceful soul, loveful soul, blissful soul. But then even that's not enough. Baba says you have to keep on churning within your mind again and again. I am a peaceful soul, I am a blissful soul. And the real test comes when there is something which comes as a challenge in front of us, which challenges our peace, which challenges our love, which challenges our contentment and so on. Then we come to know how much awareness there really is within me. So when I'm able to really become aware of it, then I can say, yes, I'm awakened. So self-respect starts off, first of all, with the information which Baba gave to us, and then that became knowledge, and that became part of our wisdom. And that I have to tell to myself again and again, I am a peaceful soul, I am a peaceful soul. Baba said in one Murli in the last season, Abhyakt Murli, that body consciousness has become so natural in you that you don't have to make efforts to become body conscious. Because for the past 63 births, you have been body conscious. So it's not difficult to become body conscious, it's so natural. But that which is natural has become unnatural. That which is unnatural has become natural. But now we have to change it once again. Back to the origin we have to go. And therefore what's really the truth, the natural form, the nature of the soul, that has to be revealed from within. But how will that be possible? Only when I am becoming aware of it again and again and again. So in order to make anything my nature, I have to do it repeatedly. Body consciousness did not become my, natu my natural nature so easily. It must have taken uh, some time at least. Maybe it's not that uh, Immediately when Copper Age began, I, I would have become so body conscious. No, no. Not just like in Kali Yuga, in Iron Age, people are so body conscious, so body conscious. The soul is totally forgotten. So as we all have become so body conscious, it, we weren't like that even at the beginning of Iron Age. We weren't like that at the beginning of Copper Age at all. So it has taken some births no, to reach that stage. And 63 births, Baba says, to reach this sta stage of body consciousness. So the first stage of body consciousness wouldn't have been so bad. We can understand the contrast between the body consciousness at the beginning of Copper Age and the body consciousness at the end of Iron Age. Definitely there would be such a big contrast. So, just as in body consciousness, there are the stages, you know, golden, silver, copper, iron stages. Now, in soul conscious stage, we go from down to up, from iron to copper to <laughs> silver to golden. And that's how we reach the golden stage of soul consciousness in golden age where everything becomes so natural. In golden age, there won't be knowledge of soul consciousness. I don't think so. Baba says that in golden age, the soul is remembered only when someone is leaving the body. That's all. That time the soul remembers, it's that own soul remembers and others also remember that this one is a soul and it has left the body. The body is like a mortal coil. It's like the dead skin of a snake. 
and the soul has gone to another body. And that soul also realizes, yes, I'm leaving one body and I'll take another body. So it's only at the time of leaving the body that the soul is remembered. But otherwise, in the whole of the lifetime, the soul conscious stage is in its natural form. There are no efforts made and also no consciousness of it. Just like Baba says that now you don't become conscious that I'm a body, it's so natural. Now to, be, to change it completely, 180 degrees, we have to change it completely from body consciousness into soul consciousness. And that is what we call as self-respect. Sometimes we completely forget the true meaning of self-respect. We mix it with ego. You know, many, many question me. What's the subtle difference? How can you make out that this is ego and, and not self-respect? What's the subtle difference? Sometimes I think this is self-respect, but actually it is ego. There could be so many incidents where the ego is felt, and, but I think it is self-respect. Supposing someone insults me. Okay, I don't answer him back, I tolerate, but next time I don't want to speak to him. Why should I speak to him? He only insults me. Now is this self-respect or is it ego? Definitely. But I may say, I, I you know I have my self-respect, why should I speak to him? Actually, why I don't wish to speak to him? Because my ego is hurt. Self-respect is never hurt, you know? Self-respect is never hurt because it is something which is the eternal stage of the soul. How can it be hurt? Self-respect means the awareness of the original qualities of the soul. That is called self-respect. So if someone insults me, maybe, but if I'm in self-respect, first of all, I will not be hurt at all. You know? Some people are not able to understand the true meaning of tolerance. They think, first of all, the egoistic people will say, why should I tolerate, you know? That is what ego will tell me, why should you tolerate? And then they'll say, for how long should you keep on tolerating? Okay, even if you tolerate it, but for how long? How many times should I tolerate? First, why should I? Then, okay, even if I should, then for how long? And then the third question, should I is it only I who has to tolerate? Why not somebody else also? Have I only to die all the time? You know, Baba says in the Murlis. But then, if I have my self-respect, I will never ask these questions. Because in my self-respect stage, actually, Tolerance is not something great, nothing, it's not big at all. Therefore, that's why we give the example of a child, an urchin, throwing a stone at a mango tree, and the mango tree in return giving a fruit, giving a mango. This is called tolerance. Tolerance does not mean that Okay, I am tolerating, I'm tolerating, I'm tolerating. Okay, I feel so bad within, but I'm not answering back and therefore I'm tolerating. This is not tolerance. But tolerance means, okay, even if someone insulted me, I give a fruit in return. This is tolerance. Because I have my self-respect, I am a peaceful soul. So I have only peace within me and therefore I give my peace. I give peace to that soul. But then some people question, isn't tolerance sometimes cowardice? If I have self-respect, okay, I, I maintain my self-respect, 
But isn't it cowardice sometimes to not answer back at all? We say, yes, be assertive. Why not? Do say whatever is in your mind. Don't be suppressive. But don't be aggressive either. You know? Sometimes what happens is we are either aggressive or we are suppressive. We answer back, how dare you tell me, you know? And sometimes we are so suppressive, we keep suppressing, suppressing, suppressing. Actually, both forms are not good. I have to be assertive, okay, I, I tell what is within me, but why not say it in a sweet tone, in a sweet manner? Because I have my self-respect. I don't have to tell the other one, well, I know what I am, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I don't have to say that either. So, what are the different ingredients for maintaining this self-respect? First of all, I need the awareness. Who am I? This is such an important question which I have to keep answering myself again and again. I don't have to tell anyone. You know, when someone is aggressive and uh, he's egoistic, and if someone is abusing him or insulting him, he'll say, you know, do you know who I am? I can show you. Hmm? He'll show his muscles and say, I'll show you what I am. You, do you know who I am? You know, he's trying to show that he can hit him back. He's trying to frighten the other person. But I tell this to myself, instead of telling to someone else, I tell it to myself. Who am I? I am that. I am a peaceful soul. So this awareness has to come again and again. And that is what I, we call as the first ingredient to self-respect. We have forgotten it. We have converted it in, into body consciousness and into ego. And therefore we have to change it back into the original consciousness of the self as a soul. What is the second ingredient to self-respect? First is, who am I? Then the second ingredient is, whose am I? It's such a beautiful consciousness of, or ingredient of self-respect. We just heard the song, you know, when we were sitting in meditation. The words were very beautiful. I'm in the company of God. And therefore there is no need to fear. No need to be afraid of. So just imagine whose company am I? When someone is in the company of a big personality, how much proud that person would be, you know? With, I met the president, I met the prime minister, I met uh, the queen, I met the king, you know? We are so proud of it. If I've taken a photograph of myself with the queen or with the president, I'll show it to everybody. Oh, see, I met the president. I met the prime minister. And that creates some self-respect too because I'm proud of myself that I could meet such a high personality. But Baba says, all these personalities in this world, what are they compared to God? So I have met God. What other self-respect could I ever have it in me? People don't realize this, you know, when we tell them, when many people come to India, especially when double foreigners come to India, they, people question, must be, they must have questioned you many times whenever you come to Madhuvan. Why are you going to India every year? Why are you going? What do you get there? India is such a poor country, yeah? they say like that. Because only the poverty of India is exposed in the media. Hardly the good things are exposed. That's what is called news, you know. They say only bad news is news. 
Hardly good news is ever news. That's it. <laughs> so only the, the poverty is exposed, the war is exposed, the killing is exposed. That's what we see on television. And therefore only that picture is exposed. And therefore many must have questioned you. Whenever you come to Madhuban, some must have come 10 times, 20 times. The older you are, the more times you have come to Madhuban. Why do you go to India every year? What do you get there? And some of you must have said, I'm, I'm, I go to India to meet God. Hmm? And some must have said, oh, are you crazy? Hmm? <laughs> yes, you must have got this reaction. You go to meet God. In India, you know, if we say this, I'm going to meet God, they say, please don't say that. And why don't say that? Because to meet God means to leave the body. Because you can meet God only after dying. You can't meet God whilst you're alive. You have to die to meet God, no? Like if you say, I'm going to heaven, so what does it mean? Only, you, only after death you go to heaven, no? You don't go to heaven before death. Only when someone dies you say, left for heavenly abode. <laughs> So, to go to heaven or to meet God means to die for that. And therefore they say, please don't say like that. And Baba tells us, for you, death or going to heaven, meeting God is the same thing. Why? Because, yes, you cannot meet God, you cannot go to heaven unless you have died alive. You have to die alive in order to meet God, in order to go to heaven. So at Sangam Yuga, we have a living death. We renounce body consciousness, that is a living death. There it is renouncing the body, here it is renouncing body consciousness. And only then we can experience God. We cannot experience God if we are body conscious, if we are alive. We have to die to experience God. And it's true. So Baba teaches us how to die alive in order to experience self-respect you know, or consciousness of the Self and consciousness of the Supreme. And we say with that pride, we meet God, we talk to God, we get instructions from God, we get all the blessings from God, we are getting inheritance from God. But all that intoxication will take place or will happen only if I have the complete faith in it. Because faith, again, is a very big ingredient for self-respect. Faith in the Self, faith in Baba. Self-awareness also comes through that faith. If that faith isn't there within the Self, faith for Baba isn't there, then I will not be able to experience self-respect. So awareness, and then the faith in that awareness. I am that and complete faith in it. No one can shake my faith. But it doesn't also mean that faith, nobody can shake means it is blind faith, no. Many people say, you know, I have complete faith in so and so, I have faith in so and so, but sometimes it is blind faith. Baba says, blind faith is not faith. Blind, we don't, we are not following Baba blindly. We are following Baba with understanding. We know it is for the benefit of the Self. We don't follow because Baba has said it, but we follow because we know it is for our benefit. Yes, Baba has said it, it is definitely for our benefit. You know, one day, uh, Brahma Baba tested someone. It's a very interesting incident. 
there were five or six uh, children sitting with Brahma Baba and Baba tested their faith. Baba asked them, do you have faith in Baba? Everyone said, yes Baba, complete faith in Baba. So Baba said, okay, if you have faith in Baba means you have faith in all that Baba says. Yes Baba, completely. Okay, you have faith in what Baba says means whatever Baba says you are ready to do. He said, yes Baba, you know, yes Baba to everything because faith, there was faith in Baba. Then Baba said, okay, I tell you, go and just go and jump in the well. Will you do it? There's a well there, go and jump in the well. Baba is telling you to do it. Will you go and do it? You have faith in Baba, you have faith in whatever Baba says and you will do whatever Baba tells you. So Baba is telling you, go and jump in that well. Will you do it if Baba tells you? What will you answer? Will you go and jump in the well because Baba is telling you, you won't jump? Why? Then how can you say that you have faith? Huh? Let me ask them. <laughs> so, what do you think? If you have faith in Baba means faith in whatever He says, and what faith in whatever He says means you will do whatever He says. So if He tells you, go and jump in the well, will you do it? Say? <laughs> yes? 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 No? You will tell Baba, no Baba, I won't jump in the well. Huh? Will you say that to Baba? Then how can you say that you have faith? Faith means complete faith, no? No? Faith in other things but not in this. And you will say, well, because I have faith in you, Baba, I know you will save me. Because I have faith in you. Yes, yeah, some people give this answer. Yes, Baba, I will do it and I have faith that you will save me because it's, I'm doing it under your instructions. Actually, Baba will not give any type of such Srimat which is not beneficial for the soul. That is also the faith. Whatever Srimat Baba gives me is for my benefit. So he will not give me such a Srimat, go and jump in the well. Why should Baba do that? Baba will never do it. He will never give me such Srimat. Have the faith that Baba will not give me such Srimat at all. This is faith too. It's not that, yes, Baba, okay, whatever you tell me, I know, Baba, you will save me, and therefore, but that is blind faith. Okay, Baba, I will jump, but you will be there to save me, and therefore I'm jumping. No, that is blind faith. But the real faith is with the understanding that whatever Baba will tell me, will be for my benefit. So this Srimat will never be given by Baba that go child, go and jump in the well. So Baba tested their faith and Baba said, all of you have failed. Why didn't you realize that Baba will never give such Srimat? Have the understanding, what type of Srimat can you expect from Baba? You know, there is also a joke on this. Blind faith means, we sometimes we take it too blindly. A very small example, a small joke type that once there was a warning of flood coming into the village. You know, rain water, uh, the dam water flowing into the village. And there was an announcement, all the villagers leave your houses, leave and go to safer places because this place is going to be flooded. And all the people ran away from their houses, but one person did not. He said, I have faith in God and God will protect me, God will save me. Well, the neighbor came and said, come, please come, otherwise you will die. You'll be drowned, the water is coming, it's just uh, maybe just uh, one furlong away and it's coming, you, we must run. He said, no, God will protect me, God will protect me. He didn't go. 
And then the water came. We got so afraid that he jumped and sat on top of his roof, in the roof of his house. And the water came and came and it reached up to the level of his stomach. And a, then a boatman came with a boat and said, come, sit in this boat. There's water everywhere. Sit in the boat, I'll take you across. I'll save you. He said, no, God is there to protect me. He didn't go. And then the water came up to this place and he stood up and the water reached here up to his neck. He was about to be drowned and a helicopter man came, helicopter and threw a, a ladder and said, come, climb this ladder and you'll be saved. He said, no, God will help me. God will help me. And ultimately he reached God. <laughs> when he reached God, he asked God, why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you save me? God said, well, I sent you three messengers. I sent you three messengers. I sent you. You didn't understand. The three messengers were the neighbor, the boatman and the helicopter man. <laughs> I sent them to you. But you didn't realize because he had only blind faith. That's why the saying goes, God helps those who help themselves. So if you say, okay, Baba, blindly, whatever you say, Baba, I'll do it. But understand it, what Srimad Baba will give to you. He won't give you any Srimad which is not the right Srimad for you. So that is understanding with faith. So awareness with the faith, when both these ingredients go together, it's like water mixing in the cement and that hardens, it becomes strong. The foundation becomes strong. And then you build the building. It will be a strong building. So awareness is the first ingredient coming of course through knowledge, through the information, through the murlis, through the courses, whatever Baba mentions about, Baba said in the murli yesterday it was, that seven days course is enough. This is the basic knowledge. Then even if you have to go somewhere, go outside, and where there are no centers, never mind, you have the murlis with you. So murli is your daily food for thought. You have it, you read it in the morning and it's there with you the whole day to give you the strength. But then the strength will come only if the awareness is continuous. And then sometimes Baba talks about the cow. You know, the cow eats in the morning, it, it grazes in the morning. And the whole day it is chewing. You must have seen cows and buffaloes, you know, chewing the whole day. The mouth is always, you know, working. They're chewing. Actually, they're not eating at that moment, but they are still chewing. How are they chewing? Because we learnt in, in zoology, that was my subject in my uh, graduation. Zoology, they, and just above the stomach of a cow or a buffalo, there's a like a small, what should you call, it's called crop, it's called C-R-O-P crop, it's like um, something which holds the uh, un indigested food. So it, it grazes, it takes in the grass and then it keeps the half digested food in the crop above the stomach. And then that food comes up again during the whole day and it is, it is chewing all the time. Though it's not eating the grass at that moment, but the mouth is always working. And then it's able to digest and that the thing goes into the stomach, the, the grass. So it eats at one go and then it uh, chews the whole day. So Baba also says you read the murli in the morning or once in a day and then you are churning it throughout the day. It is like uh, the cows churning. <laughs> So, this is called awareness and then we mix it with faith. But awareness and faith will not lead to blind faith. It comes with strength. Then, 
faith in the self and faith in Baba. Very important, very important. Then faith in the drama. This also leads to self-respect. Not just faith in the self only and faith in Baba without faith in the drama. Even that is important because faith in the drama is a very essential factor. Sometimes faith in the self and faith in, in Baba doesn't work 100%. Many things happen which should not have happened. But then it was to happen. It was fixed. And once it has happened, there are no questions. That's why Baba says, use the drama knowledge only after the incident has happened, not before the incident. Before the incident, faith in self and faith in Baba should do the magic. But sometimes past karmas are so strong, the negative karmas done are so strong that the negative result comes. But then we have to understand drama. Now when we understand drama, faith in the drama, which can lead to self-respect, in what way? Because I know my true self, I know I am eternal, I know I never die, I know I am only an actor on this world's drama stage, and therefore nothing is mine, I brought nothing, I shall take nothing, this is knowledge of the drama. Then what happens that even if I have lost something, I'm not upset, I'm not unhappy, I'm not disturbed. I don't uh, lose my control. I'm able to let go easily because I have the knowledge of the drama. And sometimes we say that because of this knowledge of drama, four things you can easily avoid. One thing is fear, no fear, because in the drama, nothing is new, so why fear? Usually we are afraid of the future because we don't know what will happen. So Baba said, nothing new will happen, everything that's happened, that will happen, would have happened in the last Kalpa also, so why fear? Also, why no fear? Because God is with me, so why fear? I am eternal, so why fear? The greatest fear is the fear of death. And I am eternal, so there's no fear of death. So no fear. Because of self-respect. Because of faith in Baba. Faith in the drama. Second, no questions either. No questions. Why should I question? Because everything is fixed, so no questions. Why is this happening? Why is that ha happening? Why should, uh, did that happen? No, it's all fixed. So no questions. No surprises. No surprises either, because nothing is new. So no fear, no questions, no surprises. And no worry either, because everything is beneficial. Nothing is unbeneficial. In this drama, everything is beneficial. Just imagine, whatever is going to happen is beneficial. It's such a powerful thought, because everything will be beneficial. Even if it seems not beneficial, but there's a big benefit behind it. Therefore, let me accept it easily, because there will be a benefit behind it. This is a wonderful drama. And once I have complete faith in the Self, in Baba, in the drama, self-respect becomes so natural. We usually lose our self-respect because of fear, questions, surprises, worries. And once I have understood all this, the self, Baba and drama, self-respect becomes so natural. So after having made the foundation strong, 
I now need to build the building. So how do I go ahead? When I have self-respect, I become carefree because I have faith in the self, in Baba, in the drama, and therefore I become carefree. But then, Baba sometimes says, this carefree nature can gradually lead to careless nature too. So there's a subtle demarcation line between carefree state and careless state. When I have self-respect, I can, I'm, I should be carefree. But that self-respect will gradually, can gradually lead me to carelessness. And therefore Baba says, real self-respect is when I'm able to maintain a balance between carefree stage and responsible stage. Sometimes when we think we are too responsible, we are not able to become carefree. And self-respect teaches us to be carefree. And sometimes when we think we are carefree, we are unable to become responsible. Now here we have to maintain this balance. So self-respect actually teaches us how to maintain this balance too. Because when I have respect for the self, I have respect for Baba. And when I have respect for Baba, it means that whatever is Baba's task is my task too. Because Baba says, at this time, I give all my titles to you children. I am ocean of knowledge, you are master oceans of knowledge. I am I'm ocean of peace, you are master oceans of peace. So when we become masters of the qualities of the Supreme, it's a very big responsibility. It's not only for the self, it's for the world. And if it's for the world, it means I have to share. And the beauty of this responsibility is that the more I share, the more I become committed, the more I become committed, and the more I give, the more I receive. This is the beauty of this responsibility. I'm not losing anything really by sharing. I'm gaining more and more. Lokic things, physical things, if we are, sh if we are sharing, yours are reducing, no doubt. If I have ten dollars and I give away five, I will have only five dollars, I won't have twenty. But if I'm sharing this responsibility of God's task, then whatever qualities which God has given me, they are increasing because I'm sharing. And the more I share, the richer I become, the more I receive, the more I prosper, the more I'm closer to Baba, and the more I'm carefree too. You know, when someone is rich, he is carefree, because he has lots of money, he doesn't have to care. The one who's poor is afraid, is uh, so worried what will he eat the, uh, as the next meal, he doesn't have food. But the one who's rich, he doesn't care, he has plenty. But then Baba says, because you have plenty, you cannot keep it with you. Again, we have to understand, if we keep it only with us, it will rot away. No? If I don't share, it will rot away. And therefore, I need to share in order to increase it. You must have heard a very interesting story. It's a very famous story in India. The story of uh, the, a father-in-law and his three daughters-in-law. He didn't know which daughter-in-law was very intelligent, very good, because he wanted to give away his inheritance to his son. So who would get the maximum? So how would he, uh, he find out? So what he did, he went, before going on a long journey, he was going on a pilgrimage, he brought some seeds, they were wheat grains, wheat seeds, and uh, he gave to his three daughters-in-law. And he said, 
keep these seeds and when I come back after six months, I shall ask them from you and you have to return them to me after six months. So he gave the seeds to his three daughters-in-law. Now the eldest daughter-in-law, when she opened that, you know, it was in a muslin cloth, the seeds were put and when she opened it, she saw they were wheat seeds, but they were wet. And wet seeds are of no use if you keep them away because after six months they'll all rot away, you know. And so what she did, she threw them away because she said, when my husband, my father-in-law comes after six months, I will give him some fresh grain, from fresh wheat which we have in our store, treasure store and, uh, and our stock room and uh, I'll give it to him. It makes no sense to keep these uh, in, in safe custody and give it to him after six months. So she threw those seeds away. Now the second daughter-in-law, when she opened uh, the, you know, the thing, and she saw they were wet seeds, but she said, no, my father-in-law is, is very strict and I have to give him these seeds. So after six months, I'll give him the same seeds. So within those six months, every second day, every third day, she would make sure that the seeds were there, but she never opened it even once, though they were wet. But she had the faith, my, my father-in-law has told me, therefore I must keep them away in safe custody. Okay, but the third daughter-in-law, she was very sensible. She said, these are wet seeds. I cannot store them away because after six months, they'll, they will rot away. So what she did, she planted them. She planted them and watered them every day. And then they grew into a nice crop and uh, she got more seeds and uh, they... The became, they became a lot in, in amount and after six months when the father-in-law came, the first daughter-in-law said, Oh, father-in-law, you are so stupid. You, you gave me wet seeds. I, how could they last for six months? So I threw them away. I will get fresh ones. Well, the father-in-law felt this one is going to be very extravagant. If I give her my, the, my inheritance, means her husband, my son, the inheritance, she will finish off the whole inheritance and keep nothing for my son. So she's not the right person. Then he asked the other second daughter-in-law, the middle one, she said, yes, father-in-law, I'll bring it. And she came and uh, she gave it to him. But when he opened it, opened the bag, now you can understand what the condition must have been. They were rot they had rotted away and there were worms coming out and it was smelling and filthy and dirty and all that. And he felt this daughter in law is also no good because she's too stingy. She's too stingy because she will never make good use of what she's given. But when the third daughter in law was asked, she said, Father in law, I need a big bullock cart to bring all what you gave me. And he asked, Why bullock cart? She said, because you gave me only a small bag full and now it has become a, you know, a big uh, sack full and therefore I need a bullock cart for that. And then the father-in-law felt, yes, this one would be the right daughter-in-law because she knows how to save, she knows how to increase and she knows also how to share with all. She knows how to give away to, you know. So she would be the right person. So what Baba tells us, whatever you get, you have to share. And with this, your self-respect will even increase further. You know, very often it happens, supposing my stage is not good. And I'm told, will you go and uh, give course to this person? Or will you go and explain the exhibition or do this service? I say, no, my stage is not good. And therefore, I will not serve today. Maybe if I serve with not a good stage, then the other person will come to know that my stage is not good and it may be disservice. So I think in this way. But actually, should I refuse? Should I refuse? Maybe Baba has sent me that service. And if I serve that soul, even if my stage is not good, 
It will boost up my state. It will be like planting that seed once again in the soil and that will freshen up and it will actually give me more strength. So instead of saying, I don't want to serve today because my stage is not good, I'm inviting more Maya. But if I say, yes, Baba, you have given me service and I'm ready for it, you forget your not good stage and you start giving. And you will experience that after you have done that service, you have that, that stage which you were in before, the upset mind and all that, will finish and your stage will become better, much better than what it was even before. So what happened was, you obeyed Baba, you obeyed your seniors or obeyed whomever, whoever asked you to do service, and you helped yourself. Otherwise, you would have brooded over your problem or your stage and then you would have never been able to come out of it on your own. So what happened actually? Because you served, you made yourself responsible, Baba gave you extra help. Not just Baba, but even that soul's blessings were with you. And that boosted up your morale, boosted up your stage, and you didn't have to really labor to get back your stage once again. So that's it. So this will increase the self-respect because there is responsibility also taken. So along with carefree stage, there is the responsible stage. So in this self-respect stage, there is a complete balance. Baba says you have to become a child and you also have to become a master. Sometimes when I'm in my self-respect stage, I think I'm the master, you know. And because I'm the master, I'm the authority, and therefore I'm getting inspirations from Baba, and uh, therefore whatever Baba is inspiring me, that I'm speaking out, and then see how Maya comes. Why wasn't my opinion accepted? Baba gave me inspirations and I spoke, and you and whatever Baba told me, that was right, and whatever came from these lips was were Baba's inspirations, and therefore they are right. But actually, no. Baba says, you become a master in your own efforts. But when it comes to be in a gathering, become a child. Now here, we lose sometimes. When we come in a gathering, because there is self-respect, we think we are the masters, and therefore we are right, and therefore uh, whatever we say should be accepted. But no, self-respect doesn't mean that. This again is self-ego. So self-respect means become a child in the gathering. Yes, as a master, give your opinion. Don't think, oh, it's Baba's inspiration and therefore Baba spoke through me. Never, never say that. You know, the Dadis also never say that. Have you ever seen Dadi Janki saying it, that Baba spoke through me? No. Dadi Ji never says it. She says, this is what I feel, but still, it's all up to you. Everyone can decide. Even Baba doesn't say it, let me tell you. You know, if supposing in a meeting and we are not able to finalize anything, or maybe we didn't have a meeting and there is uh, some question, some problem, and Dadi Gulzar is told, ask Baba, you know. So she goes to Baba and Baba listens to everything and then Baba says, okay, hold a meeting, you all decide, come to some conclusion, and then you tell Baba and then Baba will give you the answer. Baba doesn't give the answer straight away, do this. He, he first tells the children to, to do a meeting and finalize on their behalf and then Baba gives the final answer. Sometimes Baba doesn't even give the final answer. He says, let Dadiji decide. Yes? Baba becomes like a child. You know, he's a master. You know, he can give the final decision. Baba doesn't give. 
some and it's a wonder sometimes actually it is Baba's inspirations coming to Dadi Ji but Baba never says that Baba says Dadi Ji had the thought Dadi Ji had the inspiration you know how sweet Baba is how you can say you know um, humble Baba is and when Baba praises Dadi Dadi says no Baba it's you and Baba says no it's you <laughs> So much respect for each other. But yes, I, we can say that Dadiji's or the, even Dadi Janki's, their intellect is so clean that they're able to receive the inspirations so easily. Just like in clear crystal water, you can see everything underneath. Or whatever you put in it, it's, it mixes so easily because it's so clean and clear. And therefore, in self-respect stage, there is an, a wonderful balance between carefree and responsible stage, childlike stage and master stage. So many different balances we can keep in the self-respect stage. But the subtle difference has to be eliminated between ego and self-respect. We can come to know very easily. Ego is because of body consciousness. And self-respect is based on soul consciousness. Soul consciousness means I am a peaceful soul, loving soul, blissful soul. Whatever innate qualities of the soul there are, the, the intoxication of them is self-respect. And whatever talents or abilities or specialities or whatever in this world I have adopted, grasped or uh, become the embodiment of in a physical way, all that can lead to self-respect. But in order, to, uh, it can lead to self-ego. So if I want to avoid that, just transfer it. That's what Baba says, transfer them. Who gave you these abilities? Who gave you these talents? Who gave you these specialities, Baba? So even if I do have them, the consciousness changes. Baba gave them to me. Baba has given. Baba has given. And Baba has given, therefore I should take good care of them. Not only should I take good care of them, but I should make good use of them. And when I take good care of them, make good use of them, they increase. So, but it's not mine, it belongs to Baba. And if tomorrow I'm not able to do it well, I'm not uh, sad, I'm not upset. It's Baba, so Baba knows best. That's what we call as the true meaning of Karma Yoga. What does Karma Yoga mean? A yogi in action is Karma Yogi. Karma with hands and mind with Baba, with God. And when my hands are doing the actions and the mind intellect with Baba, and Baba is giving me the strength, and I'm only an instrument working, if there is success in that task, I'm not proud. I only thank Baba for the success because Baba gave the strength to make it a success. And if it is not a success, I'm not upset because I did my duty well, whatever Baba gave me. Failures are pillars of success. So there is no upset, no being upset in, for any cause or for any result too. I'm not upset because I did my duty well. So success or no success, my stage is the same. This is how we understand self-respect because my self-respect was the, even before the task was accomplished and even it's the same even after the task is ac accomplished, whether there's success or no success. I was with Baba, I am and I will always be and I know my true self. So this wonderful balance we can keep when I'm in self-respect. So I have to maintain these in ingredients, self-awareness, faith, and then balance. These three main ingredients will enable me 
to live a life of self-respect, whole Brahmin life. I can come closer to Baba, I can come closer to the Brahmin family, I can come closer to my final stage, I can come closer to my uh, elevated status which I'm going to get in the future. Om Shanti, Om Shanti. Thank you very much. Hmm? I don't know how many of you, how many of you are first timers? Any first timers? Acha, first timers too. Good. Acha, very good. So, I will just give my lokic introduction for a few minutes. The name of this body is Shiluben, Sheila, but they call me Shiluben. And I'm in this knowledge for the past 44 years. I came to Baba when I was nearly 10 years old, in the year 1959, 10, 11 years old, and studied in Bombay, living in India, of course. And I finished my graduation, then dedicated myself in 69 to Baba. And since then, I have lived in many places in India. I was in Africa for a year, one year in Mauritius in 75, 76. And since 76, I'm living in Madhuban. And I have traveled a great deal to many countries in all the five continents. Baba has sent me, but Madhuban is my permanent residence and Baba sends me to different service places here. So actually I started living in Madhuban in the year 1976 after returning from Mauritius where I was there for one year and before that in Africa, Kenya, with Vedanti Ven. And, uh, so when I came in 76, Dadiji wanted me to live in Madhuvan to translate for the double foreigners, to give classes to double foreigners. So since 76, I'm serving in Madhuvan. And you must be hearing my voice when Bab Dada speaks. So they call me his master's voice. <laughs> so when Baba speaks, you understand it through this voice. Om Shanti.